labas vakaras. Esu Rasanta Medičiūtė, esame paskaitų ir pokalbių ciklą, kuris lydi Vilniaus muziejaus parodą nuomesinės iki muziejaus vieną namą istoriją. Šį vakarą nesėdžių planetos istorija 19 ir 20 amžyje mums papasakos Ohio Valstijos universiteto dėstytojas, tyrėjas Krizos Oteris. Paskaitos trukmė apie 40 minučių. Jos metu kviečiam Vilniaus muziejaus Facebook'o paskiroje užduoti klausimus, į kurios prelegentas atsakys po paskaitos. Kadangi paskaita vyks anglų kalba, savo įžangą tęsiu angliškai, o klausimus galite rašyti tiek lietuvių, tiek anglų kalbomis. Good evening, I am Rasanta Navičiūtė, director of Vilnius Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Chris Otter, who will tell us today about the biological, technological and ecological history of the world of meat. The virtual live lecture is part of a series of events expanding the topics uh, of the Vilnius Museum exhibition from a butcher's shop to a museum, the history of a house. A big part of this exhibition is dedicated to meat industry in Vilnius, because the museum is based in a building which was owned by the Christian Butchers Guild of Vilnius for more than 300 years. Thus, uh, uh, two weeks ago, the Lithuanian historian Antanas Astrauskas started the series with a virtual talk on the Jewish butchers in Vilnius before the Second World War. And on June 9, the series will continue with an online talk by Aglerin Zevičiūtė, a researcher in history of modern management, science and technologies at the Kingston University London. She will expand on chicken and the specifics of the architecture of society's metabolism. I'm actually grateful to Agle for a reference to Chris Otter's recently published book, Diet for a Large Planet, Industrial Britain, Food Systems and World Ecology, which became a very valid reason to invite him to talk to us tonight. Dr. Chris Otter is a specialist in the history of technology and the material world, the history of food, health and disease and British history, currently working as a professor at the Ohio State University. He is the author of two books, The Victorian Eye, A Political History of Light and Vision in Britain, in the 19th century and aforementioned diet for a large planet. The latter explores the causes, consequences and experience of Britain post 18th century shift to a diet rich in meat, wheat and sugar. I assume that the talk tonight will be based on the research made for this book. We take the opportunity offered by otherwise disastrous circumstances and invite Professor Otto, who is now in Ohio, thousands of miles away and seven hours back, to talk live about, about the global systems created to produce and to distribute meat and to offer us an opportunity to see Vilnius as part of the bigger picture. Dear Chris, I hope you're there. Welcome to Vilnius, although virtually, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Raza. Um, Achu labe, um, <laughs> Lithuanian. Um, I, I, I don't uh, speak <laughs> Lithuanian. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me um, today. I am going to share my screen with you now. Um, and hopefully um, this will be uh, clear for you. Um, uh, Raza, is that okay? Can you see that? Yes, yes, it's fine. We can see it right. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm going to dive right in here um, just with some contemporary um, uh, opinions on meat uh, about the, the, the way in which meat has become um, extremely um, controversial. Um, we kill, um, as, a, as a species, 70 billion animals globally every year for meats. 
Um, and this image here is from the 2019 Eat Lancet Commission on Healthy Diets for Sustainable Food Systems. And you will see here the very small place accorded to animal protein. So in this blueprint for a healthy planet for both environmental um, and health um, reasons, um, the recommendation is that we dramatically reduce our meat consumption, heavy meat eating being particularly connected um, with global climate change. Um, yet here in the uh, United States at the moment, um, recent rumors that uh, Joe Biden was going to ban hamburgers uh, drew a predictably hysterical response from right-wing commentators. Goodbye to your burgers if you want to sign up for the Biden climate agenda. That's the finding of one study, according to Fox News. Uh, Biden, uh, these rumors ran, wants to limit Americans to four pounds of red meat a year. Um, and they currently eat uh, over uh, 200 pounds of meat um, annually. Um, Donald Trump Jr. waded into this debate um, with his usual thoughtfulness, uh, claiming that he'd eaten four pounds of red meat the previous day alone. The meat eating is central to the American culture wars, um, which are alive and well, as I'm sure all of you are well aware. But it's also central to economies. Um, it's a, a multi-billion uh, dollar industry. It's essential to um, the ecological future of the planet and it's deeply interwoven with ideas of human health. And now for most of human history, as I'm sure you're well aware, um, human meat eating has been quite modest. It's been desirable, but modest. So how and why did we start eating so much meat? Um, there are many answers to this. There's not a single answer, but one answer to this is to explore the history of, of Britain post 1800 and to explore the tremendous rise in meat eating that took place in Britain, but not just to explore that rise, but to explore what made it happen, which gets us into the biological history of livestock, uh, the history of technology, and the ecological costs of meat eating. So we're going to begin um, in 19th century Britain. Um, now, despite great class and gender disparities, um, by the late 19th century, <clears throat> Britain's meat consumption was Europe's highest. Um, Germany had very high meat consumption too. Um, in the 1830s, the average was about 75 pounds per head annually. This had almost doubled by 1912. It had reached 130 pounds. Now, initially, um, in the early part of the 19th century, this rise was achieved through high farming and selective breeding. But by the 1860s, um, there were problems with this. There were concerns about a looming meat famine, there were, there were protests about this. Um, and so there was, a, there was a, a general feeling in agriculture that something had to change. Now, this change could have been intensifying of domestic production. It could have been to reduce meat eating. It could have been to eat different animals. But the British solution um, was very different. Um, it was to outsource production. In other words, it was to use various parts of the world, Australasia, North America, South America, and parts of Europe, um, to use these parts of the world as sort of breeding spaces for livestock, and not just for any old livestock, for their own livestock, which was exported globally to various parts of the world um, to form premium herds, which would then send their meat back to Britain. This is an important event in, in the globalizing of, of the British economy. It's also an important event in evolutionary history, um, the way in which the biology of animals has been shaped by our uh, desire for meat. We have here key exports, including cattle such as the shorthorn, the Hereford bull, um, here pictured um, large white Danish pigs. Hold on a second. Um, Leicester and Lincoln sheep. Um, New Zealand lamb, and, and so forth. Now, this meant that um, by the early 20th century, um, the world meat trade focused on Britain. Um, here's a quote from the Meat and Livestock Digest in 1929. 80% of the aggregate meat trade of the world today is the products of what were originally English 
types of livestock. Um, colonization was not just about white settlers replacing indigenous populations. It was also about um, British animals replacing indigenous populations. Wherever Britons colonize, the shorthorn makes its home. This is, a, a, this is seen as a good thing here by, by Thornton. The shorthorn undoubtedly is the chief means of transmitting to other countries and other nations that great national institution of the roast beef of old England. I'll just give you one example here. Um, example of, of Danish bacon. Um, in 19th century Denmark, um, English pigs were, into, were exported to Denmark, uh, inbred with indigenous Danish land, uh, Jutish pigs to create this land race pig. This is specifically designed to produce bacon for the British table. Um, pigs were farmed within a state supported factory system. The, Danish, the Danes had this sort of ag great agricultural modernization um, undertaken in the 19th century, largely based on feeding uh, Britain. Um, quick map here will, will show you uh, the extent to which Denmark had become colonized by effectively British pigs by the early 20th century. Um, there's no natural reason for this. Uh, Denmark's population of pigs quintupled from 1871 to 1914. And by 1930, 99% global bacon and ham export to Britain. It's an astonishing statistic. Um, and we could see similar figures uh, here for, for sheep meat too, uh, if we wish to do this. So Britain becomes the absolute epicenter of the global meat economy before World War II. This is not the way, for example, Germany um, got its meat. Largely uh, developed uh, intensive agriculture within uh, German national boundaries. Now, this bodily reconfiguration involved changing the shape and form of cows. Um, Mendelian ideas were applied early. Traits like animal shape were understood as products of dominant and recessive genes. In a very short period of evolutionary time, the form of Herefords and of um, shorthorns later Frisians for the milk industry, um, what was dramatically changed. The weight gravitates, as you can see in this image, from the shoulders, where the animal does a lot of work and produce sinewy meat, to the rump, where it produces far more kind of tender meat, which is again, what was desired by British consumers. This was also accompanied by tremendous changes in cattle feeding, with a rise in um, protein rich cakes and feeds. These were often imported too. By 1899, Britain was importing the equivalent of around 6 million acres of animal feed. Now the ensuing um, development of flesh changed. Rather than laying down a thick strata of flesh um, on the outside of the animal's body, a thick strata, sorry, of fat on, the, uh, on a layer of, uh, of lean meat, fat um, and um, lean meat were produced at the same time. Now this is a process we know and understand as marbling, uh, which, which means that muscle and fat are interblended, producing meat which looks like this. Meat hasn't always looked like this. This is again a product of this kind of intense feeding from birth, which in short, and I quote, the animal is both growing and fattening from the period of, of growth. There were no longer discrete phases of growing and fattening. Um, earlier and earlier maturity was the focus, allowing more meat to be produced from fewer animals in less time. This permits a quicker turnover of, of capital. And in a, a fairly recent book, um, Capitalism in the Web of Life, Jason Moore uh, discusses the way in which our environments and living beings have been radically transformed by capitalist relations. And you can't get a better example than these animals whose very lives were determined by the profit their bodies were going to make and by making that profit in as short a time as possible. Now, with regards to the actual killing of animals, um, as you well know from uh, your museum exhibit, traditionally the slaughtering of animals um, did not take place in occluded spaces well beyond 
uh, human settlements beyond civilized field of, field of vision. In the 19th century, animals were slaughtered anywhere, in, in houses, in sheds, in shops, and there were really purpose-built structures for these. It is estimated that there were nearly 1,500 slaughterhouses in London uh, by 1875. And these were seen as very morally questionable spaces. Um, they were associated with all kinds of nefarious activities. The sounds heard and smells carried from slaughterhouses makes them perhaps the greatest of all nuisances in a large city. Um, people recorded the spectacle of children hovering around the doors watching slaughter take place. Slaughter was not something sealed from human eyes. And in addition, slaughterhouses were also spaces um, where diseased or substandard meats often entered the human food chain. So there's a lot of problems associated with slaughterhouses. Um, and these problems were overcome by, first of all, um, banishing slaughter to the outskirts of cities. Here, Birkenhead, the port uh, near Liverpool, uh, for example, for disembarking animals from the international meat trade. And then a further shift towards the construction of larger spaces uh, which were sealed from the outside, but yet allowed more sanitary control within. These were known as abattoirs. It's facilitated mass slaughter uh, in, in theoretically, at least, a more sanitary fashion. Um, the key point about the, uh, the abattoir as opposed to the slaughterhouse is it's a very differentiated space. It's broken down into all kinds of zones where specific activities take place, uh, from killing uh, the animal to slowly decomposing it into its constituent elements in specific spaces. The abattoir is a spatially partitioned, differentiated um, institution. Living animals enter at one end, um, they never get out alive, and at the end we have a stream of meat, of offal, of skin, of waste, and so forth. Now one of the key effects of the new abattoir system, which, which thrived across the world ultimately, um, was that it made um, slaughter something that was hidden. Uh, here's Victor Whitechurch, a, a British writer, um, who, who visited an abattoir in, in 1899, actually visited the Birkenhead abattoirs and watched slaughter happen and argued that he would never eat meat again. Yet as soon as he got home, he said, once one's back is turned on the abattoirs, there's nothing revolting. So he immediately returned uh, quite happily uh, to consuming meat because the whole process was so forgotten. And I think this occlusion this hiding um, of, of slaughter in, in large um, out of town complexes is integral to the scaling up of modern meat production. And we see this scaling up perhaps most obviously across Britain's commodity frontiers, across these spaces where Britain drew large amounts of overseas meat. And um, this is a famous image of the Chicago stockyards um, and moving to Argentina by 1926, there were 17 meat factories there. There were around uh, 2,000 American packing plants by 1927. And um, here's an example of the kind of meat works that we get in Australia. So these giant plants are there, again, largely for this international trade. Now, these abattoirs also enabled the concentration, um, not just of meat, but of a vast range of animal byproducts. And these byproducts are central to the profits made by the meat industry. You can really scale up the production of things like skins and hooves and make, makes the carcass an industrial feedstock, just like the byproducts of coal production went into things like plastics. Here we start to see the funneling, and this has been done throughout human history, but on this kind of scale, the funneling of waste products towards the manufacture of byproducts. So for example, gelatin, extracted from, um, from bones and from skin and from tendons, goes to make things like photographic plates, bacterial cultures, medicinal capsules, candy. Um, intestines are used for sausage uh, casing. Uh, and intestines could also be used uh, for um, producing strings for musical instruments. And also interestingly, um, tennis rackets. I uh, quote here, it took 11 intestines from, quote, strong, healthy and vigorous lambs 
to produce a racket. And again, I quote, having resilience enough to stand up against the stiff volleying and smashing services that service uh, that characterize the tennis player of today. Now, uh, Roger Federer and play, players today, they don't use intestines in their in their rackets. I just want to reassure you that uh, they use synthetic materials. And But before synthetic materials, there was this kind of organic recycling economy here. Um, another um, aspect of this was the rise of the early pharmaceutical industry. Um, we have glands reaped from various parts of the animal carcass, notably insulin uh, coming from the, the pancreas. Um, this, is, this was vital to the um, effective treatment of diabetes after the, the discovery of the causation of diabetes in the 1920s. Um, super renal glands also go into the manufacture of epinephrine and American abattoirs became particularly interwoven with the uh, pharmaceutical industry here. So this is a, another important dimension of, of slaughterhouses and particularly these larger scale abattoirs. Now, what finally of slaughter itself? Well, the traditional technique um, involved three stages. The animal was stunned. Um, and this is the stunning of the animal here with a, a pithing hammer. Um, its throat was slit and then it was bled. This is, this is the Christian way of, of slaughter. Uh, Jewish and Islamic methods, which had their own advocates and also uh, their own detractors, omitted the stunning first and simply slit the throat um, and bled. Now, in Britain, there were, there were Jewish uh, slaughterhouses in, in cities. They were, they were rarely controversial until maybe the, the later 19th century. These controversies were never fully resolved. Um, but generally speaking, the, the animal was, as you can see here, secured. It was tied up um, and then it was stunned. And it might actually be a hole in the skull into which a pithing cane was inserted, something called a pithing cane, which apparently stirred the brain and prevented the legs thrashing. And for much of the 19th and early 20th century, much of this slaughter took place in, in an unregulated fashion. Now, there were attempts to produce um, humane slaughter through technological innovations, most notably um, tools which fired or machines which fired bolts directly into the animal's head to replace the uncertainties of the polax. This um, is the Cash Captive Bolt Pistol, pioneered by the animal welfare advocate Christopher Cash and the firearms expert George Eccles in, George Eccles in 1913. This became Britain's dominant um, stunner and it was exported and used throughout the empire and it's still sold today. So this kind of, these kinds of pistols became very effective, widely used today. Uh, other uh, proposals did not succeed. This is a, um, a proposal from 1875 by Benjamin Ward Richardson, a British public health reformer for a, an abattoir which functions via quote unquote euthanasia uh, passing animals through a narcotic chamber and gassing them. Um, and th this failed because people were unsettled by the idea of eating meat from an animal that had inhaled um, coal gas and died uh, as a result. Now, to move us forward to the, the present, um, uh, historians of abattoirs and slaughter have noted how incredibly conservative slaughtering techniques are. Um, the uh, pithing, for example, you're sticking a pithing cane into an animal's head, remained legal in Britain until 2001. And it was not an issue of animal cruelty. It was about is issues of infective brain tissue that led to the, um, the banning of pithing. The controversy of slaughtering techniques continues. Uh, for example, in Belgium, it's now illegal to kill animals without stunning, which means that traditional forms of, of Islamic and Jewish slaughter are technically um, illegal. But these are ongoing issues. Uh, the point is that this is a very long and ongoing and quite slow history. Now to sum up, this is the first half of the paper. I, I, I'm just coming to a conclusion. Uh, two key principles I've discussed here. The first is acceleration. That is the speeding up of animals' lives and speeding up the slaughter and, of animals and the production of meat. The second is occlusion hiding the, the way in which meat production 
and slaughter is taken away from the public eye and housed in large complexes well away from centers of, of, of population. Most people have no idea where slaughter takes place. This means we can produce more meat at greater speed through a more efficient system and people ignore it, are not disturbed by it. And so th these two processes of acceleration and inclusion fit together. And this is one of the major reasons why um, we eat so much meat. And one of the origins of this lies in, in this great rise in, in a British meat system in the 19th century. Now I'm gonna switch gears now and bring things up to date and talk about the other dimension which is missing here, which is the ecological dimension. Um, my, my book owes a lot to the famous work of Francis Moller Pay, um, A Diet for a Small Planet, um, published uh, 50 years ago, actually, published in, in 1971 as the 50 year anniversary coming up of the book. Um, and in this book, Le Pay emphasized that a contemporary diet that was, that was rich in meat in particular, but also in refined grains and sugars, was bad for the body and it was bad for the earth. Um, she recounted a sort of growing realization of how interwoven meat eating and for example, fossil fuels and, and, and changes in our climate had become um, connected. The American diet, she noted, uh, was a product of the grain-fed meat-centered diets. It was also incredibly cheap. It was pushing the earth beyond carrying capacity, while vast swathes of the planet um, were conditioned. That had, had helped to create a world of hamburger and white bread lovers. And she urged people to eat lower on the food chain. Now, what I've done in my book is I've argued that the diet for a small planet model owes a lot to Britain as well as to America. Owes a lot to a kind of philosophy which encouraged economies of scale in meat eating and meat production. Throughout most of history, again, to repeat, most people have eat very little, eaten very little meat and almost everyone has eaten meat has eaten meat that's been locally produced. The rise of the global system of meat eating was not simply a product, as I might have implied, of colonialism, technology, and fossil fuels. Um, it also has its roots in economic ideas, um, particularly the idea of comparative advantage, um, which is associated with the uh, British economist or political economist, um, the British economist, David Ricardo, who wrote in the early 19th century and Ricardo, Ricardian economic theory argues that if a country could obtain a commodity more cheaply from overseas, then it should do so. It made no sense to protect domestic industry from foreign competition. Britain should focus on what it was good at producing, industrial products. In other words, there should be industrial nations and agricultural nations and trade would be mutually beneficial. Now, these are parts of long and ongoing debates which are very complicated about how best to feed a nation. Malthus is obviously um, important to this. Um, this theory of comparative advantage suggests, suggested that if a nation um, could import agricultural products cheaply, then it could effectively allow its agriculture to, um, to decline to run down um, and should mobilize uh, world markets for things like wheat, cotton, sugar, um, as well as in meat, producing ultimately the kinds of um, debits, the kinds of deficits that you see in this diagram. This is wheat production, which is even more astonishingly um, imported than, than meat. These arguments often hinged on grain rather than meat, but the point was it produced something that I've called in my book, the large planet philosophy, which is the, an idea that the entire planet was a potential farm for Britain, not just a farm, but also a mine um, and a forest. Um, and this philosophy won in the 19th century and by the 1850s, uh, British economic policy 
was explicitly globally free trading based on, on the importing of whatever it, it could, um, particularly agricultural products. Now, one result of this, as I noted, was a meat system that was really centered on Britain. It, it, meat was obviously exported to many places, but Britain was the biggest destination. And this involved technological challenges. For example, um, how does meat move from country to country? How does meat move from con continent to continent? Well, for much of the 19th century, meat didn't move from continent to continent, animals did. Animals um, thrived overseas, they thrived in places like Argentina and so forth, but they were then shipped back to Britain for slaughter as this rather disturbing image shows. Um, bad weather could transform decks, quote, into a veritable shambles of gored, broken animals. These were um, incredibly cruel spaces, often compared to slave ships. Now, there were many possible solutions, dried meat, canned meat, but ultimately it was, it was frozen meat and later chilled meat that won with the advance and development of effective refrigeration systems from the late 1870s and early 1880s. Um, here we have a quote uh, from the New Zealand Herald. New Zealand would be, quote, as much a province as England at as easy a source of supply to the London market as Yorkshire or Devon. Um, note this, th this is an astonishing um, thing that, that England is, happy to import meat from the exact um, opposite point of the globe. You can't have a larger planet, more large planet philosophy than this. And this really embeds food miles uh, deeply and profoundly into the system, um, particularly after the advent of chilled meat, where the meat is maintained at a temperature just below freezing. And this, this was much more um, to, to customers' tastes. They often found frozen meat to be a little uh, tasteless and a little kind of sappy. Now, refrigeration from the 18, late 1870s, early 1880s suffused the entire meat system uh, via railway cars and butchers' coolers and cold stores, forming what was what was called a cold chain. The term dates from 1908, through which meat circulated um, without um, decomposing. Um, and London's cold store capacity by 1911 was nearly 3 million carcasses. So over one third of the metropolis's human population could be stored as animal carcasses um, in these gigantic cold stores. So you always got this kind of grand reserve, uh, if you like, of, of meat products available for um, release onto the market when necessary. Now, this meant that Britain's food supply was no longer bound by its national territorial endowment. Instead, it was operating on a, a biophysically larger scale. For example, um, New Zealand again. If you note here the tremendous transformation of New Zealand's environment to feed Britain via its lamb production. The British diet then began to require a sort of expanded metabolism. We start to see these terms being thrown around by the early 20th century, um, such as ghost acreage, phantom carrying capacity, referring to the land area that was necessary to feed Britain that was not actually British. And, and grossly exceeding carrying capacity um, was advocated as economic sense. Um, if you look, for example, at the, the iconic British breakfasts, um, this breakfast being consumed in the early 20th century, the bacon uh, would, be, would be Danish, um, the wheat would probably be Canadian, the tea would come from India, um, the eggs would probably have been imported from, from Russia, the, the butter, it would also possibly have been from, from Denmark or maybe from the Netherlands. Um, every day, uh, noted one economist in 1903, Britain needed 1,000 acres of additional land, equal in productive power to that of the United Kingdom, to feed its increasing population, the kind of diet it wanted. And he did not actually even include meat in those uh, calculations. Now, by the 1960s, um, these kinds of kind of ecologically cavalier statements 
and this entirely ecologically cavalier system would be in the crosshairs of a new wave of, of ecological critique by the likes of uh, Catton, Borgstrom, we could, the, the list here could go on. Um, so what we have here uh, is, is a history of how meat becomes central to a certain way of viewing um, the use of planetary resources with no regards for limits. This is an implausible idea that, that growth, and particularly growth of, of a, a, a ecologically um, rich product can continue without biogeochemical consequences. Um, and this means that the Anglo worlds um, fast became the most territorially cavalier um, part of the entire globe. The British, the Americans, the Australians, um, and others as part of the Anglo world, their consumption habits um, require more Earths. When we talk about the, uh, the, the necessity for more Earths or the need for a small planet, we're actually largely targeting these, these large planet nations and Britain is at the centerpiece um, of this. Um, today, um, climate scientists, ecologists, uh, when they talk about the Anthropocene, they speak of an idea of nine planetary boundaries. I'm sure many of you have seen this, this, di this diagram, a series of planetary boundaries which uh, human activity, anthropogenic activity is pushing at. We should also argue Anglo-Anthropocene, uh, anthro anth Anglo-Anthropogenic um, activity. We've already exceeded two of these boundaries, as you can see here, uh, biochemical flows of phosphorus and nitrogen and genetic diversity. These are the two most closely related to meat consumption. So for example, the supplementing of organic uh, fertilizer, first by guano, then coprolite, slag, and later synthetic nitrates begins in Britain in the sort of 1830s. Uh, Justus von Liebig, um, the German chemist, complained that England, after pillaging the vegetable world for fossil fuels, was now excavating what he called an extinct animal world for fertilizer. Um, so another um, development alongside meat eating is this, is this entry into the vertiginously risky world of relying on mineralized um, agriculture through uh, fossil fuel based ultimately um, fertilizers. Meanwhile, livestock were colonizing the planet uh, by um, 1931, the, the planet's livestock uh, capacity was about 600 million. I want to draw your attention, not just here to Denmark, to the concentrations of cattle in Argentina, but also in Ireland, um, whose population was rather conveniently emptied uh, during the famine, has never recovered and was very, very quickly uh, replaced by large numbers of, of premium livestock, uh, as Karl Marx observed um, in Capital. You should also note how there's often a, a correspondence with the exception of, of India between livestock numbers and density and lack of density of population. As you can see um, in this diagram from the 60s, it's places like Uruguay, New Zealand, Australia, Argentina, that the frontiers of the British meat system, which are some of the most, which have the highest ratios of, of cattle and pigs and sheep and chickens to humans. Argentina's population density was 8.6 persons per square mile in 1928 and Canada's was 2.6. England and Wales's was 671. So again, you can see how this additional landscape is working uh, and how ecologies are formed to sate British meat lust. Now, I don't want to step on um, Egla's toes for her talk on, on chicken, but it is worth noting that um, in the um, 20th century, we have a tremendous rise um, in um, consumption of, uh, uh, of chicken, also of pork, these monogastric animals, which, which give even greater returns on, on feeding inputs. Um, Americans cons consumed about half a pound of chicken per year um, in 
the 1900s. Um, this was £70 a year by 1995. Um, and the changes in, in broiler um, morphotypes have been extraordinarily rapid. You get a sense here of the sheer volume of, of chicken that's consumed in America while looking at this. Um, such, and I quote, monospecific vast bird mass is probably unprecedented. The sheer processing of these animals, they live 42 days. Um, and according to um, one, actually I've got, I just, um, I can I jump, jump over here that, should their bones actually mummify, which they often do in aerobic landfills, um, the, the morphology of these bones, which is so different to previous chicken bones in terms of their size, um, may make them a, and I quote, a key species indicator of the proposed Anthropocene epoch. Now, the second aspect of, of sort of uh, the planetary boundaries which we've exceeded is the issue of extinction. We're living in um, the so-called sixth extinction, as well as we're living in here, the age of the chicken, um, as this rather comical image suggests, that this is a sort of iconic image of today. But we're also living in an, in an age where many animals are going extinct, many forms of livestock are going extinct. Now, when we talk about these, these um, breeds such as Herefords and Shorthorns, they are thriving at the expense um, of other uh, breeds. Uh, so for example, we see enormous numbers of breeds of pig um, and cow going extinct. There's many extinct British cattle breeds, for example, the Blue Albion, the Castle Martin, Glamorgan, the Sheeted Somerset, the Suffolk Dunn, uh, the Lincolnshire Curly Coat, um, a pig heralded from part of the country that was extinct by the early 1970s. And so when we look here at the, uh, the sixth mass extinction, we are also talking about how we've created breeds, some breeds of, of livestock at the expense of others. Uh, as Stephen Meyer notes, and this is a, an image uh, that I should have just shown along with that. Um, the Anthropocene is becoming a peculiarly homogenized assemblage of organisms unnaturally selected for their compatibility with one fundamental force, us. If we look at this sort of diagram, you can see um, that wild animals are not doing so well in terms of numbers. Cattle are superficially thriving, um, but these are reduced uh, numbers of breeds with reduced genetic um, diversity and of course living a truncated life uh, largely for our own consumption. So a couple of points just to kind of wrap things up here. Um, when we think about how and why meat has become so central to economies, to culture, to ecologies, we need to think about how meat eating has become inseparable in, in many people's minds, perhaps most people's minds, from progress. I have a quote here from the American scientist George Beard in 1898. As man grows sensitive through civilization um, or through disease, he should diminish the quality, quantity of cereals and fruits, which are far below him on the scale of evolution, and increase the quantity of animal food, so nearly related to him on the scale of evolution, and therefore more easily assimilated. The idea here is that um, being civilized involves eating larger amounts of meat. Now, reviewing world protein consumption in the 1970s, Adolf and Ernst uh, Weber concluded that wherever basic me metabolic needs are met and humans have more money, they will inevitably gravitate towards animal proteins. Um, vegetarians take note here, right? So inevitable. Development followed what was called a protein vector. And this protein vector was concentrated in a, in a number of wealthy, predominantly Anglo-Saxon nations. You can see here, Germany is also significant in this history. Um, the carbohydrate consumption declines as one gets wealthier. And this process has been, has, despite the sort of teleology and determinism here, um, has been replicated globally. You witnessed the um, explosive right, rise of meat consumption um, in China in the last 50 years. Now, this is, wasn't inevitable though. Some people pushed back. Um, 
for example, um, vegetarianism, as we understand it, as an as an explicit is an explicit um, response to industrialized meat eating. The term vegetarian in English was coined in um, in 1838 to nine. The Vegetarian Society founded in 1847. Um, you can see uh, on this map here there were a thriving number of vegetarian restaurants in London by um, the end of the 19th century. Um, many of, uh, of Britain's more important economic thinkers, Adam Smith and, and Malthus in front, uh, included, warned that meat eating was not necessarily the most efficient use of land. Um, the uh, poet Percy Shelley, um, in his Vindication of Natural Diet, which is almost a fruitarian diet, um, observed the quantity of nutritious matter, vegetable matter consumed um, by fattening the carcass would afford 10 times the sustenance if gathered immediately from the bosom of the earth. He attacked the monopolizing eater of animal flesh who devoured an acre at a meal. Um, and vegetarians were keen to, to prove that one could be a virile man because masculinity was often interwoven with meat eating by avoiding meat. Uh, here we have some vegetarian cyclists. We have one uh, vegetarian here, George Allen, broke the land's end to John O'Groat's walking record. That's from the, the tip of Cornwall up to the top of Scotland. Um, he broke the record by seven days in, in 1904. He only ate poached eggs during his, uh, his journey here. Um, it's easier to give up meat than it is to give up um, electricity or oil or even plastic. Uh, plastic is desperately hard to rid yourself of. So vegetarianism became perhaps the most basic act of politicized consumption. Now with its links to Eastern philosophy and religion, vegetarians used meat rejection to critique the entire project of Western progress. Meat came to symbolize the violence and exploitation uh, an ecological recklessness of the heart of British development. And it's actually interesting to sort of look at a map like this. Poor Lithuania doesn't seem to come out too well um, here. I'm not meaning to uh, cast aspersions, of course, here, that actually the UK has a relatively high proportion of vegetarians. The French always found this completely perplexing. <clears throat> Why would a country with so much access to meat eat, uh, have so many vegetarians? But I think it makes perfect sense in the, in the light of what I've just said. And staying with the French, a brief final point. The consumption of, of, of animals and particular types of animals is a very conservative practice. Um, it takes an awful lot for us to switch towards eating other types of living beings. Current debates, for example, over insects are proving this. Um, it makes really logical sense to for us to shift towards a more insect rich diet. But there's an awful lot of disgust to overcome that. Horse meat is pretty similar. Um, today, horse meat is not widely consumed. Um, we have just one kilogram uh, consumed in Belgium and that's the top. This is, this is still vanishingly small compared to the amount of pork or the amount of beef that we consume. But you should note here that the UK uh, sits proudly at the bottom um, here um, eating practically no horse meat unless you eat, eat dubious frozen food made by Findus. Now, the resurgence of horse meat took place in the 19th century. The horses were eaten in vanishingly small quantities in, in medieval Europe. They were far too valuable. There were, also, there were also some sort of taboos around the subject. But the resurgence took place um, in places like France and in Germany and Belgium and Italy. Um, horse meat consumption was legalized in France in 1866. And there were horse butchers established. Meat was sold largely to the working classes. There were, there were numerous public figures who, who argued that it was just a rational thing to do with old horses, put them out of their misery and eat them rather than lingering in a painful existence into old age. Now, in Britain, there were, there were very, very similar attempts to transform diet. In 1868, under the auspices of the Society for the Propagation of Horse Flesh as an article of food, uh, the antiquarian and traveler, uh, Algernon Sidney Bicknell, hosted a horse meat banquet in, in London at the Langham Hotel, in which guests were regaled with uh, uh, horse sausages, horse soup, horse steaks, actually prepared by French chefs and often using 
quite the French language, like Chevaline, to kind of uh, sort of maybe perhaps hide what people were actually eating. He then read a manifesto before the Society of Arts and published Hippophagy, the horse's food for man um, in 1868, which outlined his economic and medical and cultural and humanitarian rationale for eating horse meat. Now, what's interesting is this completely failed in, in Britain and it failed um, because butchers refused to kill and sell horses as they did not in Paris and people refused to eat horse. They argued that this was a way of feeding second class meat to poor people, which is exactly what they said in, 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 in Paris, but this didn't seem to matter to the French quite as much. Um, while in France, we see scientists and intellectuals promoting horse meat consumption, institutions willing uh, to kill horses, this momentum was never established in Britain. Um, and what actually happened is this, this meant that horse meat became associated with foreign countries, became associated with the French, associated with the Germans, and, and the same for the Americans too. Um, horse meat was only ever really consumed in, in wartime in Britain in, in World War I and World War II. This reminds us there's always a very strong cultural component to meat eating, which explains Britain's peculiar mix of high beef and high lamb consumption, relatively high level of vegetarianism and a complete aversion to horse meat. Every country and every culture has its own particular pattern here. <clears throat> so to conclude, um, the history I've told you here is, is a history of how um, meat became associated with progress, how its production became accelerated, how technology contributed to this, how it also became hidden. Um, this is a major historical development, reliant upon biological control uh, of livestock, uh, the command of vast swathes of the Earth's surface, um, and very complicated logistical systems, coordinating things like price signals and refrigeration. It's also controversial and problematic. Um, it's inseparable from questions of climate change, ecological degradation, human health, um, but also cultural identity, people's self, sense of self. As the American culture wars show, meat eating is, is a tremendously visceral subject. This situation is not caused by Britain alone. I would never want you to go away thinking this, but the British part of the story is sometimes left out when we too hastily blame America and focus on the 1945 world here. Um, because the British were instrumental in creating a global meat system where meat was um, produced in tremendous quantities in increasingly efficient ways, but in ways which were also hidden and ways which are also inseparable from the idea of progress. Now, if we, we are to, to solve our world, world food crisis, I think it's worthwhile excavating the history of these things and working out how we might possibly rethink them. Um, and that's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris, for an engaging and informative lecture. I'm trying to show myself as well. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was uh, disturbing and horrifying, so we need some hope. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us some hope? <laughs> uh, there are also several questions, and one of them is also about um, kind of are there any uh, any processes that that are stopping this increase of meat consumption? Um, I will try to, to read as well. Um, could we see any factors which help to slow down this increase apart from vegetarian culture? Is there anything else? Maybe COVID did stop it, but I, I, prob I don't think it did because the systems are too good now to be stopped somehow by technical problems. Um, I, I mean, I, I think there are the history of, uh, of alternative agriculture and, and organic farming also provides history, not here of, again, not of stopping meat eating, but of, of eating less meat. Um, I think that the global 
it's, it's, it's not really necessarily a question of cuisine, but there are plenty of cuisines which are not vegetarian, but which involve significantly less meat consumption than the kind of Anglo-American slab of meat on, on a plate. Um, so think, for example, of Italian cuisine, um, which, which uses far less meat, but uses meat in its sources, a little bit of bacon, anchovies and so forth. So I think that there are, there are other dietary trends uh, which, are, which are out there. I mean, I, I don't know. I think in a sense, it might well be the technological um, solutions of the development of incredibly um, effective synthetic uh, beef. And I'm thinking of things like the Impossible Burger and Beyond Beef, which are becoming quite popular in the United States now. I'm not sure if you've seen these things in Lithuania, um, but they, they are um, forms of uh, plant-based ground meat that are remarkably good to cook with. And actually, if you make things like chillers, you can't taste the difference. So things like this, this have actually, I mean, I, I'm someone who eats meat, but small amounts, but I, I am eating increasing amounts of meat substitutes simply because the, there's, there's really no, apart from the, apart from the fact that some people I think actually want to eat something that's been killed. If you want to eat something that's been killed, then you'll carry on eating. But if you just want to eat something that tastes like meat, the substitutes are really coming and are really quite effective now. The, the, so, so there is hope here, I think. I do think there's hope. History provides us with plenty of examples of hope and resistance, so. Okay, uh, one more uh, comment and question is that uh, recently we found out that animals are going to be legally recognized as, as sentient beings in the UK. And this means a ban on livestock export and on trophy hunting. And how do you think if at all it will affect the consumption of meat worldwide. And was this decision precedented or not? Well, um, that, that's a good, that's a good, and as I uh, lived outside the UK, I'm now, I actually don't even know about that. But one of the things that's, that, that is depressing about this history is that the rise of animal rights um, in all its forms, historically completely coincides with rising meat eating. And, and so I, I mean, my assumption would be it might make a slight bit of difference to some people in the UK, um, but globally, I, I, I doubt it. The, the, the thing that would really slow things down here, aside from the development of effective substitutes, is probably like a really serious uh, economic collapse um, another pandemic. Um, so I, um, it, it does seem that disasters, I mean, one of the things that you do definitely see and a, and a good lesson from history is, is what happens in wartime, is that in, in World War I and II, British people like um, Americans, um, who I don't, I couldn't imagine behaving like this today, were quite happy to curtail meat eating and reduce the amount of meat they ate for, the cause of, of equity and focusing of resources. It seems like in, if, if a crisis is there, um, people certainly used to be able to do this. A lot of people in the United States have commented on how um, the US has gone from making these kinds of sacrifices in the 1940s to refusing to wear masks and partying through COVID. And that this is indicative of the way that, that society has changed somewhat. And so, um, but there are historical examples of reduced meat consumption and they coincide with crisis. But this means that uh, this pandemic is the crisis kind of, it's not, not the, the scale is too small still, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I don't want to go into COVID, um, yeah. but uh, it, as pandemics go, this is pretty mild. And, um, you know, I, it, it, despite the horrors it's caused for to so many people's lives, um, uh, I spoke to a, 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 a virologist, I think, in, in, in the UK, um, who said, you know, this isn't the big one. Um, so um. here to cheer you up, everyone. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I, I, so I do, I do think that, um, you know, as a historian, um, I, I can always have the cop out of saying, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to advocate policy. I can't predict the future. Um, and the future is always unpredictable because 
um, history shows that, that history is unpredictable and, and things do happen. At the moment, though, I, I don't see the recognition of, of cows as sentient beings as something that's going to make that much difference. We were trying, uh, while preparing this exhibition, we were trying to, to look at some statistics and we looked into uh, meat consumption, looking at what kind of meat people did eat in the right. beginning of the 20th century and now in 2017. And there's a clear shift from cattle to pork. Yeah. So does this mean that we aim for fat, for those proteins, or there's something also in the production that makes it easier, cheaper, quicker to produce pork than the cattle? Um, yeah, I mean, there's two answers really I've been to that. Yes, uh, the simple answer is it is cheaper to produce uh, to produce pig meat. Um, pigs are um, much more efficient processors of, of food into flesh than cattle and, and sheep. They're not as efficient as chicken, but they are much more efficient um, because of their monogastric system. And so we see the sort of rise of, uh, of pork and bacon production in, in many parts of Europe in the 20th century. So yes, it's more profitable, simple, simple as that. The other thing is it depends whose pig you're talking about. Pigs are bred in different ways um, with different kinds of fat content. The kinds of uh, pigs I showed you there were not particularly fatty pigs um, because British people got a lot of their fat from butter and from milk and so forth. They, they wanted quite lean um, bacon. The German pig was very different, um, much fattier. So it really, again, depends on the feeding regime and, and also cultural norms. So I think that fatty meat has become less culturally acceptable and people have bred animals accordingly. There's also one more uh, question on, on the culture wars. <laughs> uh, when did the consumption of meat became uh, symbolic? Is it sort of pre-modern conception or was this notion important for the producers of meat? How much did they and their marketing strategies affect this notion of meat eating, sort of belonging to the cultural right in the mindset of consumers? Right, well, I think the, the answer is that eating meat has always been the status symbol in many, in many cultures. There's been some cultures where meat is, is taboo. But in, in, in our Western cultures, um, I think it's fairly common, stretching back to Roman times, that the wealthy would consume more meat. Um, so it's not really, it's just what's happened is this has become democratized and, and, and greatly expanded. With regards to the marketing of meat, absolutely. Um, the meat industry was very, very keen um, to promote meat, not just as healthy, but as, as something associated with power. Um, as, and, and as sci the science was developed, as something provided all, all essential amino acids. And these, these arguments become interwoven with debates about vegetarianism in, in the 20th century. As opposed to the, the cultural right, I mean, certainly the, the idea of the roast beef of old England is a very sort of conservative uh, idea. Um, and, cer and certainly in British nationalism, um, the figure of John Bull, who is a who is a, a roast beef eating gentleman, was very often um, juxtaposed with a kind of thin and weedy Frenchman uh, who did not consume the same amount of meat. The Germans were different because they were they were they were seen as eating as much meat as the British because they by World War One they did. So yeah, I mean, but the culture was, I mean, the the way in which these particular issues of vegetarianism and environmentalism have really only become definitively left-wing issues since about the 70s in most European countries. So there was a real shift uh, around the sort of around 1970, around sort of Earth Day, Vietnam, this kind of period where these things become more fully aligned. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we ran out of questions now. Okay. Um, and uh, I would like to thank you, Chris, once thank again. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Also to thank our audience for the time and questions. And uh, uh, this lecture, as well as other lectures within the series, will be available online on the uh, Vilnius Museum Facebook page for further exploration. We also plan to translate this lecture, if you allow, Chris, 
Oh, and sure, uh, yes, absolutely. In the Lithuanian, and uh, to put subtitles on the video record in a couple of weeks, and then it will be available for broader audience, maybe. Terrific, thank you. Uh, as mentioned before, this lecture is accompanying Vilnius Museum exhibition from a budget shop to a museum, the history of a house. Those who are based in Vilnius or near Vilnius are, of course, cordially invited to visit the exhibition, which is open until June 27, and to investigate the local meat story. And uh, once again, Chris, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And I would like to finish with this. And have a thank nice you. day there, and also a nice evening here. Thank you very thank much, you. and thank you, for everyone, for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.